Welcome everyone to today's uh, Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives Co-op Conversation. Uh, my name is Stan Yu. I am the Research and Communications Coordinator at the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives and I'm filling in today for our director Marc-Andre Pigeon, uh, who is typically our host uh, for these monthly co-op conversations. Uh, he is currently away uh, at a conference. Uh, before we begin our conversation today, I want to acknowledge that we are coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the Métis. Today, our co-op conversation will be talking about how uh, many international development agencies have uh, historically, uh, and some continue uh, to work towards uh, decolonizing and dismantling the uh, top-down approach uh, to economic development that has long been criticized by uh, recipients as paternalistic, oppressive, inefficient, and insensitive to local realities. Uh, throughout our conversation with our speaker, uh, Tian Wan, who I'll introduce uh, momentarily, uh, I encourage you to consider lessons here in our own country um, or sorry, lessons here uh, our own country can learn from when it comes to historic and persistent notions of economic development for, by, and with Indigenous communities. And I am reminded that there are lessons that we can reflect on uh, about how we can and need to do better. Before we hear from Tian, a word on the process about uh, our to our event today. Uh, unlike co-op conversations of past, uh, we are going to do things a little bit differently today. Uh, Tian has uh, generously overprepared for his talk and has 40 minutes uh, worth of content. Um, so therefore, uh, today uh, we will proceed uh, to do away with the breakout group um, sessions that we typically uh, have as a feature of these co-op conversations and proceed with a 40 minute presentation from Tian and then a 20 minute open uh, question and answer period. Um, in other words, uh, once Tian has concluded his presentation, uh, we will open it up uh, for any and all uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and we look forward uh, to the conversation as uh, one large group today. During this event, if anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties, you can message Natalie Callio, uh, professional research assistant here at the center. Natalie, if you can kindly wave, I see there we are. Uh, Natalie would be pleased uh, and available uh, to assist you. Um, I know that folks are, are very uh, uh, used to Zoom now. Uh, however, in the event that some uh, odd issue comes up with your microphone or video quality, anything like that, uh, please don't hesitate to let Natalie know. Um, lastly, uh, as I mentioned before, we are recording this session and the link will be shared with everyone who registered uh, for this event. Uh, all of that will be emailed to you uh, in the next day or so after today's talk. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Tian Wan. Uh, Tian Wan is the Cooperative Development Specialist at the Cooperative Development Foundation of Canada, or CDF Canada. He supports the design and implementation of projects to use the cooperative model as a vehicle for local economic development and social resilience. Tian has experience designing cooperative development strategies to facilitate technology adoption, access to financial strategies, agricultural value chains, women empowerment, climate smart agriculture, child care service provision, et cetera. He also provides technical support to the program team regarding cooperative governance, cooperative assessment, cooperative startups, et cetera. Uh, a wealth of experience here. Uh, you folks are in for a treat. Uh, I should also mention that Tian is a PhD student at the University of Saskatchewan and a former Fredian scholarship recipient here at the center. Um, so with all of that, I would like you to uh, join me in welcoming uh, Tian and uh, Tian, I will pass the mic uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Stan. Um, it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to talk about international development and our integrated co-op approach to you guys. So firstly, let me share my screen to you. Um, can you all see my screen here? We can, it looks great. Great, great, okay. Um, yeah, so again, thank you so much, uh, Stan, for the introduction. Um, it is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to share with you 
uh, our international development work and our cooperative approach. So I, I think um, everybody agrees that this world is facing so many challenges, um, climate change, extreme weather, inflation, food crisis, a war, pandemic, and more. Um, I think all of, the, all of us can feel the influence in, in our lives in, in Canada, um, but in many uh, developing countries, the, the challenges are more serious. So before I talk about the concept of international development, uh, I want to show some numbers to you, some quite frustrating numbers, actually. Um, those are some information I, I got from the uh, news articles. So um, about 27, 278 million people in Africa, approximately one fifth of the total population went hungry in 2021, um, an increase of 50 million people since uh, 2019. And this number is projected to rise to 310 million in 2030. Um, the, cri the food crisis is partially caused by the supply chain dis disruption uh, due to the pandemic and due to the war in, in Ukraine. Um, but more importantly, it is due to the climate change. So, so for example, um, in Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, 36.1 uh, million people are affected by severe drought, up from 19 million in July this year. Um, and when it comes to climate change, Africa is one of the most affected area. Uh, the temperature is rising faster in Africa. Uh, there are more floods in wet regions, but more droughts in the dry regions. And 95% of, of African farmers rely on, rely on rainfall and do not have irrigation systems. Um, in addition to all of this, um, the strong dollar uh, make people in developing countries less affordable for food and for other products. So with all this frustrating fact in mind, uh, I want to introduce you the concept of international development. So there are many definitions for international development. Here I, I used the one from the um, uh, Boston University's African Center, African Studies Centers. So international development it is, is defined as a benevolent flow of resources and expertise from developed nations such as Canada um, to developing nations such as African countries or Latin American countries or Southeast Asian countries. Um, so the key international development players include international multilateral institutions such as the World Bank, IMF, United Nations system, um, and government donors such as USAID. So US, U, USAID means a United States Agency for International Development. Um, and here in Canada, um, Global Affairs Canada is a, is, a, is a major donor for international development. And international and uh, local NGOs, uh, for example, us, uh, CDF Canada. Um, and we work together to develop strategies and implement projects uh, in the international development sector. Um, and the commonly used goals or guidance for international development are the SDGs, uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think most of us, if, uh, if not all, uh, may be familiar with uh, as the, at least some of the SDGs. So here are the 17 SDGs. Uh, some ones are you know, very often discussed in Canada um, as well. Like for example, um, gender equality, uh, climate action, biodiversity, no poverty. Um, and so on. So, so I guess um, although international development is crucial uh, to make a better world, I guess one very important issue is always about the cost and benefit. Um, it is about the aid effectiveness, uh, the, the efficiency and sustainability. Because if you uh, think about where the money comes from for international development, um, it is the hardworking donors income or the taxpayers money um, donated uh, by the government agencies representing their citizens. So this is why exploring the international development approach is really important. Uh, so here I listed uh, five approaches. Um, the first one is the traditionally used uh, paternalistic top-down approach. Uh, this is widely criticized as efficient. And uh, most of the international development agencies um, has walk away from this approach and embraced, has embraced more like uh, approaches that involve more local participation, um, accountability, 
uh, social capital and capacity building uh, to, in order to increase the project effectiveness, efficiency, and sustainability. Um, so let's start from the community-based development. Um, this approach focuses on the participation of the community. Uh, it can range from lighter uh, community uh, uh, participation, for example, simple information sharing to some uh, local economic, um, uh, uh, local social economic and political empowerment of the community. Um, so then the next one is community driven development. Uh, it's actually part of the uh, it's actually part of the community based development. But if you see the name, it actually puts the community not only as the participant, but actually in the driver's seat. Um, so community driven development um, fits on the empowerment end of the community based development. And it, act it actively engages, uh, engages beneficiaries in the design uh, management and implementation of the projects. And it gives the community the actual control of the decision-making and the project resources at nearly all stages. Uh, so community-driven development approach was firstly developed by World Bank and mainly used in, in the infrastructure projects. Um, Locally-led development uh, was developed by USAID and it focuses on the word local um, and uh, focuses on strengthening and partnering with the local systems, uh, such as local government, local NGOs, local businesses, and so on. Um, and community-led development, uh, sometimes people use this uh, concept interchangeably with community-based development, but actually they have uh, different focuses. So community-led development uh, focuses, on, focuses on the change process. So the process uh, more than the outcome and highlights the importance of a community making decisions and making changes together. Um, so all these uh, approaches, um, their main contribution is that they recognize uh, the, importance, the uh, important role of the local uh, stakeholders. So if you think about uh, the stakeholders in the international development, um, we have international NGOs, we have international donors, and, and we have some, uh, have some local uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, the contribution of these approaches is that they highlights the local stakeholders uh, and the importance of their local knowledge, uh, participation, uh, social capital in the collective action. Um, but they have limitations too, uh, because local communities are not a black box. Um, so the features of the, these local communities are not well discussed in these approaches. And those features can actually influence the outcome of international development projects. So this is why um, some articles um, pointed out some barriers of these approaches uh, despite their contributions. So the first one is about effective participation. Um, is, is there indeed actual, uh, is there uh, actually effective participation? Um, are people motivated to participate in the process, in the project? Um, because research indicates that poor people uh, may be less motivated to participate in the process because firstly, um, it is costly for them to, to take time uh, to participate in the activities. Um, for example, join repeated meetings. Um, and secondly, um, does participation lead to their preferred outcome? Um, in an imbalanced power structure, for example, it is hard for them to actually influence the final decisions, even though, even if they do, partic they, they do participate in the process. So they participate in the process, they take their time, but actually they cannot change the final decisions. Um, so, so that's why, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a reasonable um, uh, skept uh, skeptics, uh, it's a reasonable doubt whether there's effective participation or not. Um, and then whether there's shared vision, um, does the community have shared vision to, to facilitate the process? Um, if, um, if there's no shared vision, then the collective action can be very costly because you know, different people have different interests and there will be a major decision uh, cost in the process. Um, and um, I think the third one is really important. Is, is there elite capture and imbalanced power structure? 
Um, if yes, then um, if, it is, if it is a small group of people control and benefit from the resources, then giving the resources and the control to the community will only strengthen the previous structure and only benefit the elites, um, at least benefit the elites more than the marginalized groups. Um, and uh, it's the community linked with a network that can support their ongoing success. Um, it's their enabling environment to represent their voice and in changing needs and advocate for a favorable policy and legal framework. Um, and does the project make sense from economic perspective? Um, because during the project, uh, many things are funded by the project funds. Uh, but what about afterwards? Does the community have the business uh, capability to maintain the operation, to maintain the uh, equipment or the infrastructure that are funded by the project in the longer term? Um, and do they have institution and social capital to maintain the operation? Uh, because during the project, again, uh, the project team can support coordinating and organizing the activities, but can the community do that by themselves after the project? So that's a, that's a question uh, as well. And uh, do they have the platform to cultivate their human capital um, so that they can rely on, on themselves after the project? Um, so when, when it comes to all of these barriers, uh, we can see that uh, the concept community or local uh, cannot be regarded as a black box. Um, there must be a, there must be discussion um, on the internal magazine, mechanism or institution uh, institutional design. Um, so that is why we have our cooperative approach um, because the nature of co-ops and the value and the principles co-ops stick to uh, make co-ops a very good institutional solution to tackle the barriers we just discussed. Um, so in, in, our, in our cooperative approach, uh, we put co-op as the platform, uh, the coordinator, the engine, and the leader in international development projects uh, to achieve the SDG goals. Uh, and the objectives of uh, most international development uh, can, uh, 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 the, the objects of the uh, most international development projects uh, can be put into three uh, categories. Uh, social objectives, such as women empowerment um, and social equality and equity. Um, economic objectives, such as food security, uh, poverty reduction and employment. And environmental objectives, such as uh, biodiversity um, and climate actions. Um, and only the overlapping part the objectives that takes into consideration all the three type of, types of objectives can be desirable, effective, and sustainable because you know, all the three parts influence, are influencing each other. Um, so we want a type of economic development that builds a better society and a better environment. And a better society and a better environment can also support a better and more resilient economy. Um, so for example, um, as you can see, the two pictures I, I put here are the pictures we took in our 4R project, uh, 4R Nutrient Stewardship Project, um, together with Fertilizer Canada and local partners founded by uh, Global Affairs Canada. So in our 4R project, we, we want to build a gender-sensitive, uh, climate-smart agriculture in rural Af Africa, which cover uh, all the three types of objectives here. And in our 4R project, uh, uh, responding to the unsustainable fertilizer usage, uh, we train the farmers, uh, including and especially the women farmers, to use the 4R principles. Uh, so 4R principles means uh, right rate, um, right type, right place, right time to efficiently use fertilizer uh, to significantly improve their productivity. Um, and co-ops uh, play a role in this process in terms of coordinating the training um, providing farmers with access to credits, um, access to input supplies, and uh, access to marketing opportunities. Uh, so so co-op are the platform to make sure that the 4R practice uh, can be adopted with uh, relevant value chain supports and adopted by you know, different groups, groups of people, especially the marginalized group of people. Um, 
And we, we also want to uh, achieve gender sensitive economic development so that women can benefit, uh, make decisions, empower themselves and build human capital in, in the process uh, so that they can, they can play a bigger role uh, in the co-ops in the community um, and, uh, and, and improve their social status. So co-ops can play very important role as well by including women as members, uh, granting them the rights to decide and to benefit um, and giving them the platform to shine and to grow um, as member, as staff, as board director, or as the manager. Um, and um, in order for the co-op to make the roles, uh, to take the roles to, to achieve uh, this economic, social, and environmental objectives, uh, they need to be economically viable. So that's the very, very, very basic condition. They need to be uh, able to survive in the longer term from the business perspective. Um, and they must serve the members' shared economic needs and have the capacity to, gener to generate benefit for the members. Uh, and that is why we have a model called um, integrated, uh, integrated co-op model to guide our cooperative development practice. Uh, so the model highlights um, the interdependence of the producer's three basic needs. Uh, production, marketing, um, and the financial access. Um, and, um, and those elements, those pillars uh, can be further explained by detailed elements under each pillar. Uh, so I, I, I put all the elements here. Uh, for example, in the production uh, part, um, there can be elements like uh, climate resilient input. There can be um, uh, diversified livelihood with off-farm income. Uh, there can be uh, uh, technology and equipment, and uh, you know, for other for for financial access pillar and for marketing pillar as well. There there are many elements that we can focus on uh, during the development of the co-op, and uh, this model uh, emphasizes uh, the interdependence uh, or the integration of different pillars or elements. So, for example, um, the increase of the productive uh, productivity. Uh, cannot be transformed to financial success if there's no marketing capacity. And the production should be supported um, by financial services, for example, uh, through what is called the, the, value, chain, the value chain financing, uh, where the credit unions can provide loans uh, given the contracts signed by the farmers and the, and the buyers. Um, and the increased income uh, and financial needs of the farmers and agribusinesses, for example, can contribute to the development of the financial cooperatives so that they can have uh, more resources to support their communities. Um, and when the objective, when the project objective have environmental and social objectives, this model also provide a guidance in terms of integrating the economic viability with the non-economic objectives. So for example, uh, we have some climate action projects and we think about how co-ops can serve the community's three basic business needs, production, marketing, and financial access so that the community can have ongoing motivation and uh, economic resources to, uh, to take climate actions even after the project ends. Um, and in, in order to serve um, in order to serve the members' needs as well as the project objectives, uh, we are dedicated in building an integrated co-op system and uh, the enabling environment. So here, um, I put all of the stakeholders we work with in our international projects here in this uh, in this graph. Um, they can be um, they can be put into three big circles. Uh, so the first one is the country co-op system um, and the cooperation among those uh, co-ops. So basically in our projects, we establish new co-ops to meet the community's uh, common social, cultural, econ and economic needs, um, or we strengthen existing co-ops uh, in terms of uh, to strengthen their governance or strengthen their uh, business capacity. Um, so here you can see there are different types of co-ops we work with um, in the, district in the very local community level, um, we build um, daycare co-ops, um, uh, village or community co-ops, 
Um, in Ghana, it's called uh, village co-ops, and in Ethiopia, it's called multi-purpose co-op. And VSLAs uh, and RCWG. So VSLA is a village savings and loans association. So this is kind of an informal financial institution that cultivate the farmer's habit to save. So basically, uh, weekly or monthly, if they have some money, uh, they give the money to uh, the community leader and save that in a very secure box. Uh, and the, 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 the box will be locked and the key will be uh, managed by the community leader. And at the end of the year, uh, during the share out process, uh, the money will uh, be taken out from the box and uh, given back to the farmers. And then the farmers will be like, oh, I can save so much money during the year, uh, something I didn't expect. Um, uh, and during the process, the, the VSLA can also provide micro, um, micro loans, microfinance services to the farmers because the, the interest rate for microfinance is very high. In some countries, 20, 30, 40, even 50%. Um, so this VSLA not only cultivate farmers' habit to save, but also give them additional uh, 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 kind of motivation because they can earn uh, uh, interest rate from their fellow uh, farmers. And then because those, uh, uh, those co-ops at the local level are small, uh, they can, support and be supported by some you know larger co-ops um, at the district level or regional level so for example cycles uh, cycles means uh, uh, savings and uh, credit cooperative associations uh, organizations so basically that's uh, another term for credit unions in Canada they are basically the same it's just different names and a district or regional level co-ops uh, in Ghana is called a zonal co-ops um, in Ethiopia, it is called uh, uh, co-op unions. So basically, they are kind of a second-tier co-op uh, that are larger, that can take advantage of the economies of scales to supply the inputs or marketing services to the, zo to the, uh, to the uh, village or community level co-ops and through this village co-ops uh, to the farmers. Um, and then we also support the co-ops as the coordinator and the vehicles to adopt technologies or, or best practices, uh, for example, climate mitigation uh, practices or climate uh, uh, adaptation uh, practices, um, by building the linkage between the co-ops and some other stakeholders. So here uh, I listed some stakeholders uh, in this upper um, box, uh, such as uh, various levels of government agencies, uh, research institutes and industry associations. Um, uh, the example will be 4R uh, as well. In our 4R project, for example, in Ethiopia, um, the, the stakeholder responsible for advocating best practice agriculture is the agriculture office um, in, in different levels of the government. And we also work uh, with uh, uh, research institutes such as MPNI, and Fertilizer Canada, which is you know Canadians fertilizer industry organization. So we work all, with all these stakeholders uh, to build the linkage between them and the co-ops to provide best practice uh, agricultural um, uh, technology or, or techniques. So um, so this so basically this box um, has the stakeholders we call value chain partners or or country partners or enabling environment stakeholders. Um, and we want to build the connections between these stakeholders and the local uh, cooperative stakeholders uh, in order to build a resilient local economy, um, society and environment. Um, um, and then there's another box here, which is the, uh, the, the stakeholders uh, from Canada or from, uh, from the international uh, platform. Um, such as uh, Canadian volunteers, uh, the co-ops in Canada, uh, and they make a, con a great contribution uh, to the international development and to the development uh, of the co-ops in, in, in the developing countries, uh, which is a, a very classic example of the cooperation among cooperatives. Um, so basically what we want to do and what we have been doing in our uh, international projects is that we build the system of co-ops and the supporters from the value chain and the, the enabling environment um, to, uh, to set up a systematic co-op system 
to achieve the social and economic and environmental objectives. So, so basically, I kind of link this uh, stakeholder map with the very uh, with the uh, with the uh, slide uh, 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 earlier. So basically, we use this uh, co-op system uh, as the platform or as the driver um, to support in the international uh, development projects and to achieve the social objectives, environmental objectives, and the economic objectives. Um, I, I, here I, I want to mention um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the co-ops in Canada, uh, uh, like uh, I want to mention their important role because we, uh, we have a, a women mentorship program, uh, which, is, which has a 20 year history. And this year's event uh, was held last month. Uh, so it trends and uh, educates women co-op managers uh, such as uh, uh, credit union branch managers uh, for their professional and personal growth. So we invite these ladies to Canada uh, one week in, in the classroom in Ottawa, uh, one week in Canadian credit union host to learn about uh, you know, the Canadian credit union's best practices, and then come back to Ottawa to wrap things up. So, um, so I really want to take the chance to thank all uh, the volunteers and Canadian credit unions uh, for your support. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, we see a significant impact um, of uh, the program and the, the support from the Canadian credit unions. Um, my, my colleague told me that 80% of the participants stay in the credit union sector um, in the past 20 years, and many became the CEOs um, uh, in, their credit, in, in their credit unions and become the leader in their credit union development in, in their specific countries. Um, and I also want to uh, mention our uh, voice project, uh, which is again related to the stakeholder Canadian volunteers. Um, so we have, current, we, we have a current project called Voice. Uh, we send volunteers, uh, Canadian volunteers to uh, African countries uh, to support their international, uh, to support their co-op development and to make a contribution to their community. And we're now still recruiting volunteers. Uh, so if you have a passion uh, in international development, or if you know anybody else, uh, you know that want to participate in, in this uh, meaningful process, please uh, feel free to let me know, uh, or my colleague know, and uh, we're, we will be really, really grateful for your participation. Um, so I want to wrap, uh, wrap, wrap, uh, wrap up my presentation by um, summarizing the advantage of the co-op approach uh, in international development. Um, so I think um, co-op approach is sort of the approaches, uh, part of the approaches I mentioned earlier, com community-based approach, community-driven approach, locally-led approach, but it is one step forward. It's, it's part of their approach, but, it, but it's slightly different um, because it can make a, uh, make a, a significant contribution to um, those four issues. So first of all, uh, project effectiveness. Um, it can uh, increase the community participation, um, review the local knowledge, and encourage the local ownership. And it can take, youth, uh, take advantage of the co-op asset. Um, so for example, in our 4R project, um, we use the co-op offices as the place to have meetings and to give the trainings to the farmers. Um, and in some countries, uh, the co-op even have their collective um, owned land. So, so in that case, it is convenient for them to set up a demonstration plot on the collectively owned land and to try out some new practices. Um, another contribution of the co-op approach is it can promote inclusion and democracy um, because co-op is an inclusive institution that enables the marginalized group to participate in the process and to benefit from the community development. Um, and co-ops uh, democratic governance uh, fosters equity and equality. Um, the third advantage is about empowerment. Um, uh, co-ops provide business platforms to nurture human capital and empower marginalized groups. And the, collect uh, the, the collective actions with the cooperative uh, connect individual farmers with the stakeholders, um, for example, research institutes, industry organizations, and government agencies um, to uh, provide services 
uh, information training and education to the community members. Um, um, last but, but not least, um, the co-op approach give more scaling up potential and uh, more long-term resilience uh, to the local economy um, because co-op can be linked with enabling environment and the networks um, to uh, uh, the next works of, for example, APEX organizations, government agencies, and the value chain players. Um, and to build a resilient, viable economy that can fund the project's uh, assets or operations even after the project term. Um, so, so I guess that's why we're so confident with the co-op approach, and we think uh, you know co-op approach can make a contribution to achieving all the uh, social, economic, and environmental objectives uh, that we want to achieve uh, for for the international communities. Um, so that's my presentation. Um, now, uh, feel free to uh, let me know if you have any questions. I, I look forward to um, communicating with you about international development and the, the role of co-ops. Thank you. Thank you, Tian, for this very rich and interesting talk. Uh, I, we have already received a few questions uh, via the chat, uh, so I'll ask them first, but I will mention to everyone that uh, if you have a question, please feel free to either use the hand raise function on your uh, Zoom call um, under the icon reactions. There is uh, an option for you to raise your hand. You can also put your question in the chat or if you are um, prefer to just raise your hand physically, uh, both Natalie and I will be looking through uh, everyone's uh, windows to see if there are any there is anyone with their hands raised. Uh, so rest assured, uh, use any uh, method that is most comfortable to you, and we will be sure to get to your question if we have time. And we have twenty minutes uh, for questions here. Um, so. Tian, I'll ask uh, Mike's question. He was the first uh, to to ask uh, one of uh, he asked two questions, uh, one of which was a question that I had. And, and the second, uh, I know you touched upon a little bit, but um, perhaps we can ask you to elaborate. Uh, so question one, how do you identify projects of interest that um, of interest that are abroad? Uh, number two, how do you ensure sustainability once the initial funding runs out? Uh, again, I know with regards to the second question, you mentioned, uh, you touched upon this in your last slide, but perhaps you can give uh, an example uh, of, you know, once a project uh, concludes, uh, how do some of these, you know, perhaps Apex organizations then um, provide, you know, additional support uh, down the line? Uh, two questions for you to start. Uh, so I'll I'll answer the second question first. Uh, so we we do track the um, the the process the the um, we do track the influence of our uh, project after the project ends. So we have volunteers, some very passionate volunteers, keep eyes uh, keep an eye on what's going on after the uh, leave the country they left the country. So for example, in Indonesia, um, we support building uh, a credit union. Uh, women's credit union in some villages. Um, and so they have regular meetings even after the project ends and they, 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 they send us uh, some information that you know, we, we have this uh, election uh, you know, uh, last month and uh, somebody is, was elected as the, uh, the leader for us. Um, and we can see that um, the change stays there in the community because you know, for religious reasons, for cultural reasons, at the very beginning, we, we, we did see um, barriers in terms of changing the uh, local governance structure. Um, but, um, but after you know, the five years project, we can see gradually people accept that, for example, women can play a role and should play an important role in their community affairs, in their local economy. And we do see that culture is changed uh, and stays there in, in the local communities. Um, and then, um, I want to mention the uh, integrated core model uh, again, uh, because the 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 only um, the only way to make sure uh, the supports from the project can be operated in an ongoing way is that they have financial via like the economic viability for them to operate the uh, the you know the, uh, the 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 practice. So, for example, um, in our four in our four project, 
uh, we train the farmers to use fertilizer. But even though they, they realize that fertilizer, uh, you know, uh, for our principle is useful um, to increase their product productivity. But if, if there's no relevant services, for example, uh, the stable, cheap, secure input supply, fertilizer imply, uh, supply to them, then they will have no way uh, to purchase the fertilizer they want, right? So they know it's useful, but they need additional support from the value chain uh, perspective. So that's why, you know, even though uh, in our four principle, in our four project, production is the driver, um, but we 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 should also think about financial access, input supply, and marketing opportunities as the integrated uh, system. Um, so I'm not sure whether that answers the second uh, question. What, what is the first question again? Sorry about that. Not a problem, Tian. It's uh, how do you identify projects of interest? And I'm guessing this is uh, from uh, the CDF's perspective. The project of interest. Um, or as a so, project of interest, like I guess, how do you decide which projects to take on as an organization um, and which country, you know, which community, et cetera? Yeah, so that, that is a great question. Uh, Again, in, in this uh, uh, project uh, development and implementation process, we have different stakeholders. Uh, some stakeholders are the international founders, such as Global Affairs Canada. They have their priorities. They have their priority, prioritized subjects, such as gender, uh, like women empowerment, biodiversity, uh, climate actions. And they have their prioritized countries, such as Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, something like that. So, so here, uh, so we, on one side, we have the needs from the international uh, stakeholders. And on the other side, we have the needs from the local stakeholders we have, because we have the connection with the local NGOs. We have a deep connection with the local co-ops. So we know what's going on there. We know, so for example, in, in Ethiopia, uh, we know that last month or you know, uh, earlier this year, the government um, uh, issued a policy to promote um, uh, a natural resource uh, management best practice and focus on the wetland uh, watershed management. And we know in that part of Ethiopia where we have stakeholders working there, uh, there's a need to utilize, to better utilize their water, watershed resources. So, when, so then we, we, you know, we sit together and dis discuss whether there's a chance uh, to build a watershed co-ops to serve the local communities. And that uh, project idea is um, kind of an overlapped uh, area of the interest from, uh, from the stakeholders, uh, local stakeholders, international stakeholders, and the co-op uh, co sector in Canada and in, in Africa. So that, that's you know, how we um, figure out what, what type of uh, projects are the most interesting uh, ones. Um, and we, we focus on uh, promoting those kind of opportunities as a priority. Excellent, thank you, Tian. Another question here, um, does the model, does the cooperative model work with the assumptions about previous knowledge of the peoples that is meant to benefit, um, such as understandings of land, cultural practices? Uh, I imagine, you know, um, I come from the Western notion of, of cooperatives. Uh, is there, a, a, how does that space interact in terms of uh, creating or cultivating a shared understanding of the cooperative model um, that is shared between, um, you know, how we see it in Canada, as well as um, the folks uh, that uh, the projects are, are aimed to benefit. Um, thank you. That, that, is, that is also a very great question. Um, Co-op differs in different countries from a legal perspective, uh, from the cultural perspective. I know in many post-communism countries, co-ops are not a very reputable um, type of business. So they don't quite like co-ops, um, but you know, the needs are there. The, the common social, cultural, economic needs are there. So basically what we do is to really focus on the needs and then discuss with them regarding their cultural perspective and try to use the co-op model that fits in their local cultural and economic context. So for example, the, the BSLA, um, BSLA is not something new in Canada or in developed uh, countries. It's something new in, uh, it's something firstly developed in Africa, uh, and it's kind of informal uh, organization. You, you don't, in many countries, you don't need to register 
uh, them as a co-op. But they are co-ops because they are they have uh, democratic governance. Uh, they they serve the shared vision and needs. Uh, so so I, I guess uh, even though we are called co-ops and we are uh, we 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 are co-op uh, developers and we are very familiar with co-op definitions, co-op principles. Uh, I, th I think it's important for us to be open to um, different cont uh, contests and to be open to um, the flexibility uh, of the co-op in different uh, contests. Um, so I'm not sure whether that answers the question. Oh, that was great. Thank you, Tian. And I think this also dovetails well to a question that we received here. Um, I'm going to jump to that question just because I think you addressed it, but uh, just uh, I'll ask you just to confirm. So the question is, is registering co-ops part of international development work or it's the responsibility of the co-op themselves and optional? Uh, what are usually the criteria for the co-ops to be registered? Um, so I, you know, I, I wonder, I guess, uh, Part of the question will be, as you mentioned before, you meet people, um, the, the the members or, or the the organizers where where they are, and you don't necessarily need to put the word co-op in your organization for you to live uh, cooperative principles. Um, does the registration piece uh, is that an important part? Is that part of your work? How does that work? Uh, in in most uh, in most cases, it is very important to register the co-ops. Uh, in the government system, because you know, uh, again, in one of the slides, I mentioned the uh, enabling environment and the uh, integrated system of the stake uh, of the uh, stakeholders um, of the co-ops and other stakeholders, and and uh, building the linkage between the co-op stakeholders and uh, non-co-op stakeholders. So, uh, one condition for those for building such linkage, um, in in many cases. It's the formal uh, registration because in order for them to receive a government support, uh, to be part of the APEX organizations, or to have formal business uh, relationship with some value chain players, you need to be formally registered. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question, what is the uh, what is the uh, uh, criteria uh, to to get them registered? Um, that that is very complicated because different countries have different uh, legal uh, different policies and legal requirements. So um, I like in Ghana, uh, the registration process is different from in Ukraine. Uh, I know I have a colleague uh, from Ukraine here uh, today in this uh, conversation. Uh, so if we have time after the uh, questions, we probably uh, if, she, if she wants to say a few words, uh, we can ask her to share uh, her experience in, in Ukraine developing uh, co-ops there, but yeah. Great, thank you. Another question here, um, how far my country, Tanzania, can be involved in the projects done by CDF? I imagine probably the easiest way is uh, for us to provide her with an email address to CDF Canada um, for, for them to uh, inquire uh, about their you know contacts and, and see if that might be a good fit there. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for that interest. Uh, I, I know my colleagues are working on the proposal in Tanzania. So, um, so hopefully um, uh, that can be approved by our donors. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but definitely uh, Tanzania is a country we are extremely interested in uh, uh, to implement our projects because uh, again, uh, Tanzania has a lot of natural, uh, natural resources uh, that can adopt uh, you know, better uh, natural resource management practices. Uh, you have the Victoria Lake, uh, Victoria Lake, you have the safari, you have so many wild animals. Um, so, so definitely it's a promising land and definitely co-op can play a role in, um, in again, achieving the social, economic and environmental objectives in, in, in African countries. Excellent. Next question for Etienne. How inclusive are fair trade principles in the co-op model approach? Um, well, I, I I can say that most of the uh, most of the fair trade partners, um, at least the major part of the fair trade partners, are co-op organizations. So we have a previous beneficiary called um, uh, uh, Norandino. Uh, if if the question is asked by a fair trade. Uh, uh, a fellow, probably you, you heard about this name. So they are Peru's biggest coffee producer or cacao producer. So they are a partner of the fair trade. We have a, a co-op here in Canada called uh, um, 
La Siembra, uh, if I didn't remember wrong the name. Uh, and uh, La Siembra is a workers' co-op in Ontario, in, in Ottawa. So they uh, imported uh, uh, the organic coffee and chocolate products from Norandino uh, through the fair trade network. So uh, again, this is a typical example of cooperation among co-ops, you know, work, workers co-op in Canada and the agricultural co-ops in, in Norandino. Norandino is a very, very interesting case. So I can, I can you know, probably in, in the next uh, conversation, I can talk about that for an hour. They have a lot of climate action uh, activities. They have the uh, carbon credit uh, exchange with international partners. But anyways, uh, they are a typical uh, successful example of utilizing the fair trade uh, network to, to, uh, to market their value added products. So their chocolate is better than others because they're organic. And because they are co-ops, they, they can enjoy some, uh, you know, market uh, the price premium uh, than some other, uh, you know, companies like um, uh, Nestle or uh, uh, Kershaw's or something like that. But yeah. I can confirm that the name is La Siembra. Uh, we have had a chance to um, meet with them and interview them and they're, they're a very cool organization. Yeah. Those are the questions that I see so far in the chat. Uh, Natalie, are there any other questions that have been sent to you or any other hand raised that we um, aren't, aren't noticing just yet? No, that's all I have on my end. We still have a few minutes left. If you have any final burning questions, please feel free um, to ask them. Uh, we still have Tian for another few minutes. I'll give everyone a few seconds. Any last burning questions? Okay, going once, going twice. Okay. If not, uh, I want to uh, thank you, Tian, once again uh, for this very rich and insightful talk today and for giving us your time. Um, for everyone, thank you very much for joining us. We will be sharing a link to the recording uh, of the session the next day or so. Uh, I do want to mention that we have quite a few um, events coming up here at the Canadian Center for Study of Cooperatives uh, that I'd like to share with you uh, before we part today. Uh, first, uh, we'll be announcing this in the coming days uh, in a formal sense, but our 2022 Fredian lecture, which features our most recent uh, Hartley and Margaret Fredian and scholarship uh, winner, uh, which uh, Tian was the recipient in, I believe, 2019, um, is taking place on November 30th uh, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock uh, p.m. in Saskatchewan time. Uh, the recipient of the scholarship this year is Bill Omekin. Uh, Bill Omekin is an atypical PhD student uh, who has had extensive uh, and uh, long and extensive professional experience with practicing cooperative law uh, and is on the boards of several cooperatives in Wisconsin, um, such as the uh, education and insurance arm of the $440 billion American farm credit system. Uh, this will be a digital event anyone is, uh, um, everyone is invited and it is free to attend. Uh, our next co-op conversation will be taking place on December 7th uh, at 12 p.m. Saskatchewan time. Our speaker will be Susan Henry, the Director of Community Impact and Financial Inclusion at Alterna Savings. Uh, Susan's talk will be highlighting Alterna's uh, Community Microfinance uh, Program, its successes and lessons learned um, since its inception. So we're very much looking forward to that conversation. Uh, similarly, similar to the Fredian lecture, the uh, registration will be opening in the coming days. And finally, our annual McPherson talk, um, which honors the late Dr. Ian McPherson, um, will be taking place on December 15th uh, this year at 4.30 p.m. Uh, this will be a hybrid event so that uh, you can join online or if you are in Saskatoon or can travel to Saskatoon, uh, we ask uh, that you join us uh, in person. Uh, details will be coming out shortly. Uh, the talk will feature Josh Campbell, 
He is an educator and freelance journalist uh, based in Saskatchewan. And Josh's talk will be exploring how the little known past of one of Canada's preeminent hockey schools um, could be marshaled into a, imagine a new agrarian university built around permaculture, distributism, and cooperative values and principles. Um, so three talks coming up. Um, that's a lot of information for simplicity's sake please feel free to keep posted on our website, social media channels, uh, or our newsletter. Um, and uh, all of these will be formally announced in the coming days. Uh, with that, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Tian, once again, uh, for your great presentation. Uh, we hope to see you at one of our uh, future events. Uh, and if you want to get uh, in touch with us, um, please feel free to visit our website and find us, uh, we're, we're available. So with that, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you again.